All right, question 52, we're getting into some group theory here. The group in question is the group of permutations of four objects. This is also known as the symmetric group of order four, or for short, S4. An element of S4 is just a way you could shuffle up four objects, that's it. So if we call our four objects, I don't know, A, B, C, and D maybe, one way we could shuffle them is by flipping A and B. That would give us B, A, C, D. That action, changing this order into this order, is an element of this group. The way you write that element is one comma two to indicate that we're taking the element in the first position and we're moving it to the second position. And then we're taking the element in the second position and moving it back to the first position. We're not messing with the third and fourth positions at all. Another element of this group would be one, two, three, which we can think of as taking our four objects, A, B, C, and D, and moving the one from the first position to the second position. So the A ends up here moving the one from the second position to the third position, so the B ends up here, and then moving the one from the third position back to the first position, so the C ends up out here. D doesn't get moved at all, it's still in the fourth position. One more while we're here, maybe we can consider the element two, three. Maybe you can think about where that would move these different objects. If you're thinking we'd end up with A, C, B, D, that's perfect. All we're doing is taking the second object, moving it to the third spot, and then the third object goes back to the second spot. It turns out this group has 24 elements. I've listed three of them here. The reason I've listed three of them is because hopefully this one and this one kind of seem similar in some sense, and this one seems different. In this first case and this third case, we're just permuting a pair of objects. We're switching the spots of the ones and the twos, or the twos and the threes, or whatever. But in the second case, there's three objects involved. So it's fundamentally a different type of element. It would be nice if we could make that a little bit more concrete. If we could kind of classify this first element and this third element in the same class and put this second element in a different class. Well, it turns out you can. Those classes are just called conjugacy classes. And that's what this question is about. All conjugacy classes are, are a way to partition the elements of a group into classes according to their fundamental behavior. That's a little bit vague and I'll give you a more concrete definition of conjugacy classes later in this video. But this is the idea of conjugacy classes. And if you understand this idea of conjugacy classes, it might not surprise you to find out that the conjugacy classes of any symmetric group, so in particular S4, are just the different cycle types. Okay, so what are the cycle types? Well, we've already seen two different types. There's this type where we just permute two objects. So this element one, two is of that cycle type, as is this element two, three. There's also the type where you cycle three objects. That's the type that we saw with this element here. Different than both of those will be the type where you cycle four objects. So for example, if I took my objects A, B, C, and D, where I moved A to where B is, B to where C is, C to where D is, and D back to where A is. The way I would write this element would be one, two, three, four, and it'd be fundamentally different than any of these elements that I've seen above. Why? Because it involves all four objects instead of just a pair of them or three of them. Are these all the different cycle types? I mean, you only have four objects. If you think about it for a little while, hopefully you can convince yourself that the answer is no. You could also permute two distinct pairs. Maybe you take the first object and permute that with the second object, and then you take the third object and permute that with the fourth object. So if my objects are A, B, C, and D, when I flip A and B, I end up with B, A. When I flip C and D, I end up with D, C. Again, fundamentally different than anything we've seen, therefore a new cycle type. Is that all of them? Well, really close to all of them. There's one kind of trick case. There's the identity permutation that just leaves everything alone. So if my objects were A, B, C, and D, applying this permutation would leave me with A, B, C, and D. We can write it as just an empty set of parentheses. This is our fifth and final cycle type. If you believe me that these are the five different cycle types and you believe me that the conjugacy classes of symmetric groups are just the cycle types, then the total number of conjugacy classes of this group would just be E, five. And that's the right answer, but I feel like I need to talk more about this. First off, you might notice that I said permute two distinct pairs here. You might wonder about the element that permutes one and two, and then permutes two and three, right? So if I start out with A, B, C, D, it switches A and B, so now A is in the second spot, and then it permutes two and three, so now A and C switch spots. And yeah, that might feel fundamentally different than anything we've done, but if you look a little bit more closely at the net effect, what we've done is left D alone and changed ABC to BCA. We've moved the first object A to the third spot where C used to be, and then took that third object C and moved it to the second spot where B used to be. 
and took that second object B and moved it to the first spot where A used to be. What I'm saying is when your permutations are not distinct, you don't have a new element, you just have a different way of writing an element that we already saw. In fact, I think it's a good exercise to list all the different elements in this group. There's 24 of them because SN always has N factorial elements and four factorial is 24. It's not necessary for this specific problem, but I think it would deepen your understanding of the symmetric groups and therefore might be worthwhile. So how many ways can I permute two objects? Well, the way to think about it is I have to choose two of the four objects and then flip them. So I have four objects, I need to choose two of them. Four choose two is equal to six. Let's see if we can list all six elements. We can permute one and two. We can permute one and three. We can permute one and four. We can permute two and three. We can permute two and four. And we can permute three and four. If you count these up, you'll see we have six. These are all the permutations of two objects. What about cycles of three objects? Well, the way I think about this is if we're gonna cycle three objects and we have four of them, there's four choose three, in other words, four ways of choosing the three objects, but there's two different directions that we can cycle them in. So there's two times four choose three, in other words, eight elements that correspond with these three cycles. If the elements I choose are one, two, and three, I can cycle them in this order or in this order. If the elements that I choose are one, two, and four, I can cycle them in this order or in this order. If the elements that I choose are one, three, and four, I can cycle them in this order or I can cycle them in this order. And finally, if the elements that I choose are two, three, and four, I can cycle them this way or cycle them this way. Eight elements corresponding with the eight three cycles in S4. What about cycles of four objects? A little low on room, so maybe I can throw these down here. Well, the way I think about this is if we're gonna cycle all four objects, we first ask ourselves the question, where should the first object go? We got three choices for where it goes. We could send it to two, we could send it to three, or we could send it to four. Regardless of what we choose, we got two choices left for where we send that second element. So we have three choices and then we have two choices. In total, we have six choices. If we start out with this one, two, we can send the two to three or we can send the two to four. If we send the two to three, we're left with sending the three to four. If we send the two to four, we're left with sending the four to three. Similarly, if we start out with one, three, we choose between two and four for our next object, leaving us with four or two for our last object. If we start out with one and four, we're choosing between two and three for our third object, leaving us with three or two for our fourth object. These are the six different four cycles in S4. What if we're permuting two distinct pairs? Well, kind of like with the four cycles, if we're permuting two distinct pairs, we're using all four objects. So object one has to go somewhere. I have three choices for where I send object one. Either I can send it to two, to three, or to four. And once I make my choice, I'm left with only two objects that need to get permuted. So I don't really have any choice at all. What I'm saying is there's really only three choices if we're permuting two distinct pairs. Adding to that our one identity element, we see all 24 elements in this group S4. Finally, and you might argue that I'm doing this kind of out of order, but now that we understand S4 and we're able to list the different cycle types, I should prove or at least justify why the conjugacy classes in a symmetric group are just these cycle types. In order to do that, I need a better definition of the conjugacy classes than just a partitioning according to their behavior. So here's a more concrete definition of conjugacy classes. Two elements in a group, maybe I'll call them sigma one and sigma two, are in the same conjugacy class if there exists some element G inside this group, so some other element, such that sigma one is equal to G times sigma two times G inverse. Because G is a group, it contains the identity element, and using that identity element in place of G, and therefore also G inverse, shows us that an element is in the same conjugacy class of itself, well, that's a good thing. The fact that G is a group tells us that every element has an inverse element, so this definition makes sense. If you multiply both sides of this equation on the right by G, you get sigma one G is equal to G sigma two G inverse G, but G inverse G is just the identity element, so you get that sigma one G is equal to G sigma two, which is an equivalent definition of conjugacy classes. A key fact, and the reason that the cycle types in the symmetric groups define the conjugacy classes is that the conjugate of a cycle of k elements is always just a cycle of k elements. So if I take 
one of these three cycles and I conjugate it with some other element in the group, I'm guaranteed to get another three cycle. That's why the cycle types make up the conjugacy classes. Why is this true? Well, you don't need to prove things, but it's a pretty straightforward fact. If I have some cycle, maybe I'll call it sigma, that takes some object, maybe I'll call it A1, to some other object, A2, to some other object, A3, and so on, all the way until I get to AK, right? I got a K cycle here. And I conjugate this element with some other element, G. So I look at G, sigma, G inverse. It turns out that that's just equal to G of A1, G of A2, G of A3, and so on, all the way up to G of AK. All a conjugation does is it changes the names of the elements in the cycle, but it leaves fixed the fact that it's a K cycle. Why is this true? Well, think about applying this element to, I don't know, maybe this object. I'll just pick one arbitrarily. So I got G of sigma of G inverse of this object, G of A2. Well, because of associativity, I can group G and G inverse and just get the identity element. So this is just equal to G of sigma of this object A2. But sigma of A2 is something that I know because sigma is defined to take A2 to A3. So this is just G of sigma of A2, which is A3. What I'm saying is that if I apply this element to this object, G of A2, what I get is G of A3. And nothing special about G of A2 and G of A3, that'll be true for any of these objects. Conjugating just changes the names or the labels of the objects. It doesn't change the type of element. You conjugate a K cycle, you end up with the K cycle. If I take one of our three cycles, like, I don't know, one, three, two, just picking one arbitrarily, and I wanna change that into one, four, two by conjugating, it's easy enough to do. G of one, three, two times G inverse will be equal to one, four, two for some element G. Why? Because when I conjugate one, three, two by G, I get G of one, G of three, G of two. So in order to make that equal to one, four, two, I just need to define G to be the element in my group that takes one to one, three to four, two to two, and therefore four to three. G would just be the permutation of three and four. So I start out with these objects, A, B, C, and D. Since G permutes three and four, G inverse also permutes three and four. So when I apply G inverse, I get A, B, D, C. When I apply one, three, two, I take the object in the first spot and move it to the third spot. I take the object in the third spot and move it to the second spot. I take the object in the second spot and move it to the first spot. And I leave the fourth spot alone. And then I apply G, which permutes three and four. I get B, D, C, A, which is exactly what I would get if I started out with these same four objects and applied this transformation. The object in the first spot goes to the fourth spot. So the A ends up out here. The object in the fourth spot goes to the second spot, so the D ends up here. The object in the second spot goes back to the first spot, so the B goes here, and the C is left untouched. Anyways, you're not asked to show all this. You're not asked to find the element in the group that conjugates this three cycle into this three cycle, or any other element of a conjugacy class to some other element of its conjugacy class, but you certainly could be, which is why I want to go over all this stuff. As far as this problem goes, if you can see that conjugating K cycles gives you a K cycle, then maybe you can talk yourself into the conjugacy classes in a symmetric group just being the different cycle types. From there, it's easy enough to list out the five different cycle types, and that tells you the total number of conjugacy classes in this group G, five in this case. A similar question might ask you what the maximum number of elements in a conjugacy class is. To that, you'd answer eight because we have eight elements in this conjugacy class of three cycles. It might ask you if any conjugacy class of S4 contains exactly four elements. You'd sure think so, seeing this S4 right here. But as we've shown by looking at the different conjugacy classes, none of the classes have exactly four elements in them. There's six, eight, six, three, and one. Tons of different questions that could be asked of you, but all that was asked of you is the total number of conjugacy classes, which is the same as the total number of cycle types, which is just five.